Mary McAleese has shown us by her example how imagination, ideas, the humane use of reason and persuasion can break calcified patterns and forge novel, exhilarating new possibilities, connections and solidarities. As Heaney put it in his poem, Beacons at Bialtana, let us speak the unstrange word as it behoves us here, move lips, move minds and make new meanings flare. She is one of the great public figures of our time, a great Irish citizen and an inspirational leader. Please join me in making her welcome. Thank you very much. Okay, no more Mr. Nice Guy. No. <laughs> My husband doesn't recognise me from the description. <laughs> um, Mary, thank you, thank you again for coming. It's an absolute delight to, to have you here. Um, uh, I'm going to speak maybe, at, we'll have just a chat for about 45 minutes, and then uh, we have had, I hope you all saw, some slips outside for people to fill in, and uh, we'll take some questions from the audience that have been written down. Uh, for the last 10 or 15, 15 minutes of, of tonight's proceedings, if that's okay. Um, I want to maybe just begin with, with a couple of reflections about your presidency as a whole. Um, you obviously enjoyed it. You went for a second office. You didn't have to. Um, during your inauguration speech, you said, you quoted uh, Carvalho Dali, the presidents don't have policies, presidents have a theme. Uh, and that theme, in your case, was bridging buildings. Building bridges. I'm just. What I'm wondering is, did you ever, did you find the need to give up policies, to bite your lip, not to be able to engage in politics, to be above politics? Did you ever find that restrictive during your term in office? Not once. Huh? The world of politics never really. Um, I was actually very happy not to be involved in the down and dirty day-to-day -day politics. And the great thing about the presidency in Ireland. It's not an executive role to a significant extent. It has some relatively, what you might call low level, though relatively important at the same time, executive powers. But it operates a kind, in a kind of a, a moral or pastoral space. Um, and I think that was very important at that time, to be able to operate in a space where you were able to give leadership on things, on issues that were about the, the macro politics of the day, and in particular, the macro politics of the future. To be able to encourage people to break out of ways of looking at things that held us back, that paralyzed us, that kept us from really getting to know our neighbors well. So, yeah, I, I, what propelled, I, I, to be honest, if I'd wanted to be involved in day-to-day -day politics, I was in the wrong place. If you're going to run for presidency, run for the job read the job description and honor the job description. So I was never tempted away. To tell you the truth, there was plenty to be done without getting involved in it. You know, <laughs> there was enough to be done. Mm. Yeah. So, um, okay, you were 14 years, when you came to power, um, 1997, it was a time, not just in Ireland, but I suppose around the world, when there was much to be optimistic about. Um, in Ireland, okay, the, the Good Friday Agreement had not yet been signed, but it was about to be signed. There was a momentum. There was a momentum, there was a process. process. Mm. Uh, around the world, we know it was four years before 9-11. People were talking about the, the end of history because the old conflict, the Cold War uh, was over. Great optimism. And also, I suppose, economically, uh, Ireland, things were looking auspicious in Ireland. Uh, if the Celtic Tiger wasn't quite at its height, things, things were looking very good. By the time you ended the presidency, things were very different. So there was a huge change in fortunes over that time. I mean, what was it like to be in, that, uh, to be in the presidency over such historical period, over, over so many change, over such a, such a peak and such a trough? Well, it was a pain in the neck because you kept having to change the script. <laughs> um, you couldn't just cut and paste the old speech from last year to this year because, uh, yes, human nature being what it is, it constantly confounded us, and the narrative changed quite dramatically. But what didn't change dramatically was the momentum for peace. That was the interesting part of the narrative. 
Um, it was tested, God knows. I was in office um, a m matter of six months when we had the Good Friday Agreement. And right up to the moment the Good Friday Agreement was signed, we couldn't be sure we'd ever have the Good Friday Agreement. So for me, look, taking, taking the long-term view of history, this was by far the most important thing because this was beginning to take um, a country with a whole set of very complex relationships that was a bit like you know, a, a bunch of Lego bricks that um, you needed to build in a particular way but had always been skewed. Mm. And we had to get them, we had a chance now to get things the right way up, to get the relationships within Northern Ireland right, the relationships between North and South right, and the relationships with Britain right. So, and we had to keep doing that and keep focused on that no matter what was happening on the economic front. And I also had a view, I mean, the economic story went from, isn't it wonderful, we've ended emigration, we were now a country of net inward migration for the first time in our history, and we began to feel the surging power that comes from that confidence. We also felt the surging power that comes from overconfidence. Mm. And, and, there was a, there, and then we had, I suppose, if anybody here has done, anybody here done the ice bucket challenge? <laughs> well, we sort of went through a collective ice bucket challenge in Ireland. We kind of had this collective dowsing in the cold water of the reality of the banking crisis, economic recession, and suddenly our kids who had been returning from Australia and Canada and England and America, suddenly they were back on the road. They were back on the road here. This place has always been, you know, it's always been the shock absorber for what happens in Ireland. So you will know many of them came here. In fact, at the airport uh, on the way here, we met a gentleman whose six children were here. And all come in very, very recent years. And I just thought of the sadness of that because there was a time when we were all saying to each other, isn't it great that we're the generation can keep our kids at home? Mm. You know, and that does mean a lot. To, at least to have the choice that if they are going to go to Australia or New Zealand or Canada or wherever, that they're going not because they're driven, but by the force of economics and necessity, but because they make that simple choice, which is a different, you know, different, it's a different context. So, um, so that the constant changing of the economic story from good news then the slide, um, and now the good news story is beginning you know, beginning to resume again after years of uh, really very tough times when people, a lot of people, young people particularly, caught in negative equity in homes and they lost their jobs and a lot of, a real lot of worry and anxiety that we had hoped we'd left behind us. But that was a time, I'm, I had a view really that that would always come right in the end because we were an educated population, the most educated in the history of our country uh, yes, we were tied in globally. We were now essentially um, a globally exporting economy, um, not just exporting our people, but exporting now a range of more and more sophisticated goods. We were getting smarter, though you wouldn't not always notice it to, you know, to look at the way in which we dealt with the economics of the Celtic tiger, but we learned from that. And so I always had a view that, I suppose just looking at the world and economics, they do tend to go in cycles, regrettably. But there's something more linear about the peace process. And it was the investment that we had to make. If we could secure the peace, I felt, and secure the future for our young people and keep our minds focused on that. First of all, that would help us economically because really who wants to invest in political instability? That had always been an issue. Mm. So particularly north of the border. So if we could get that narrative straightened out, imp imperfect though it was, that was the important thing to concentrate on. And it's always been my passion because, as you said, I grew up in Belfast. Yep. Uh, in the, I grew up in a place called Ardoin, which is still today, um, it's the area with the highest density, the highest per capita uh, sectarian murders. You know, it's not, it's not a particularly great statistic to own, but it happens to be the truth of the area I grew up in. 70% unemployment. There probably still is 70% unemployment there. So it's a tough neighborhood with a lot of problems and would be characterized very often as a Catholic ghetto. But my parents, for reasons that I have never ever been able to understand, uh, who had nine children, I never understood that either, but they had the nine <laughs> children and my, my mom and her sisters between them had 60 children. And 
my, yeah, and my, my, my grandson, uh, who's 10 months old, is the 238th direct descendant of my own grandmother. Because we've often said that my family felt they had to increase, multiply, and fill the earth entirely by themselves. <laughs> um, uh, and they're still at it by the looks of things. Um, and um, so that was the, I was, I, I, and we all lived on top of each other. As my husband will tell you, when I got married, I could not cook for two people. Complete waste of time. Buy a takeaway. I wouldn't be bothered cooking for two people, but I could cook for 22. So he put on three stone in the first year that we were married. And we had to buy a freezer then before I copped on to the fact that I didn't have, you know, not only eight brothers and sisters and mother and father and nine million cousins to cook for. Um, so that was, that was my context. I, we grew up in what is nowadays defined or delineated as a Catholic ghetto. But in fact, it's not a Catholic ghetto. It's, it was, in my day growing up, um, one side of a road um, was Catholic and the other side was Protestant. And for some reason that I, my parents never bothered to explain to us, they kept buying houses in Protestant areas, like as if they wanted to maximize the problems with health and safety of their children. <laughs> but what it gave us, what we grew up with were, were a lot of Protestant friends and what I might call a kind of street wisdom you, you knew where to go, you knew where not to go, you knew where was safe, you knew where was unsafe. And you also got a very good grounding in the huge differentials that existed within both the Catholic community and the Protestant community. The other thing was that my father had a pub and that was the, that was the place where I did my degree in psychology. <laughs> and um, so I, I, I look back and I think, you know, to my parents who, you know, who looked like they constantly were trying to have us killed uh, by moving into areas that were morbidly dangerous, uh, nonetheless managed to secure our, more or less to secure our safety eventually at the end, though not always um, completely. Um, and they were, I think they were vindicated in the choices that they made. I'm not really sure that they made them strategically. Um, I'm fairly sure they didn't make them strategically. Actually, I'm morally certain they didn't. They were just sort of accidents that happened. And uh, because they were very naive, Mm -hmm. And they thought the best of people, and they never ever thought that anybody would ever come, you know, and put us out of our home or do bad, because they, they would have been incapable of doing bad things to anybody. Uh, anyway, they wouldn't have had time with nine kids to do bad things to anybody. <laughs> and, um, and so they just always thought that, they, they, were, they were optimists, basically. Yeah. You know, they had an I, optimistic view of life. And I'm, I'm just, clearly this formative experience, being in the cauldron of conflict and experiencing uh, you know, make, presumably you must have had a lot of friends who are Protestants and that's an, as, that's an aspect from the other community, uh, but also experiencing the intimidation that I was talking about and that's on the record. You went from that to being this peacemaker, to somebody who, 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 uh, whose presidency was marked on the theme of building bridges and that was put to very, very practical terms, such as I mentioned hosting um, a, 12th of July, a 12th of July reception the very first ours. time in the history of Ireland that there was an official commemoration, and either you, north or south, for the 12th of and July. And you must, you must have had extraordinary criticism for doing oh, that look. too. Oh, look. Oh, don't talk. But, but how uh, did you... We were savaged, eaten and spat out from a height. Yeah. And at the beginning. But, I get, and I, then, I, but that's what leaders have to do. You have yeah. to do it and show that it's going to work and that it's going to deliver something really good. And you have to believe in that because that's what leaders, leaders are called, look, to push out into the deep. And you push out into the deep and then you prove to people that actually it's not as deep as they think. They're not going to sink, they're not going to drown. So Martin and I, we, I mean, he grew up in East Belfast also. He had parents who kept planting themselves in the middle of Protestant communities. Um, uh, to maximize the, the, say, the health and safety dangers that he faced every day going to school. And, but out of that came for us two things really. We knew the people in Northern Ireland. We knew our, we knew our hinterland, I would say, better than most people, Did better than most. But we also had a passion for reconciling those constituencies because we knew this is where the good Lord planted us in this world for whatever reason. I mean, there, there are all sorts of places that I would prefer to have been born, like Malaga would have been nice. Um, and, um, but that's not where we ended up. So this is where we were. These were the problems that were around us. We could have run away from them. We could have ignored them. We could have insulated ourselves from them. But somehow or another, we didn't do that. And we couldn't, whatever kind of temperament we had. We are, I think, in, uh, we are probably 
I think we're both problem solvers. Mm. It's give us a problem and let's try and unbundle this problem and see can we pick out the bits and pieces that we can make a contribution to. And, and was that your initial reaction? I mean, did you have feelings of bitterness? initially? Did you have... Never did, thank God, I never yeah. did. Look, um, some of the strangest things happened to us, um, remarkable and weird things that, um, that keep you... From, I, first of all, I never heard a bitter word spoken in my home, okay. thank God. Now, yeah. that's not to say that I didn't hear bitter politics at times, because I've told this story before. My, 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 my parents were bog-standard Irish nationalists, you know? Yeah. Uh, my father, I'd say, was an Ari a good old-fashioned Irish Republican. So, um, you can imagine, I mean, politically, he wouldn't have had much time for the British. Yeah. Uh, and he would have said that from time to time, particularly in conversations on either the radio or television with Margaret Thatcher, who seemed to particularly incense him. And, she, and, it, and it was great because at one stage after a bomb in our my father's pub was bombed and a young woman was killed in the explosion. And she died actually in my father's arms. He went to grab her and she died in his arms and he became quite uh, mentally ill. He became catatonic for a period after that. And it was thanks to Margaret Thatcher, apparently, that he started to speak and talk again. <laughs> um, yeah, unbelievable. I, can, I, I told this story, Father Michael said, he's heard it now twice this week, unfortunately, I think. Um, but I came home, from, I came home from, um, from university one day, and my father used to just sit and stare into the fire most of the time, and he, he was quite a sad-looking person. And I said to my mother, uh, well, how's Dad today? And she said, you're not going to believe this. She said, he started to talk again. And um, I said, what? really, seriously? She said, yeah. I said, what did he say? He said, shut up, you old bitch. And I said, what? <laughs> I said, no, oh, God. I said, what, the, what provoked that? Thinking that he had said this to my mother <laughs> after she being so good to him through all this. And I said, what did he say? No, she said, it wasn't to me. She said, it was to some woman on the radio called Maggie Thatcher. <laughs> and uh, at that time, she wasn't prime minister. She was minister for education, I think. And at that time, she must have said something about Northern Ireland on the radio, because he always had the radio on. And um, anyway, whatever, he, whatever she said really, really upset him. And it was great because um, she provoked him out of himself. Mm. And from then on, he kept up a really very passionate one-sided conversation with that woman <laughs> for years, for years. So, but having said that, like when, when my brother, my brother John, who's just a year younger than, two years younger than me, he's profoundly deaf from birth. He was the victim of an absolutely appalling sectarian episode that left him for dead at our doorstep. And, oh, I was angry. I was very, very, very angry about that. I'll tell you, you know, I was, mm. I was, but, but my parents' attitude was, they were very scared of fostering anger because they knew where that led to. Fostering anger in a conflict zone where there are paramilitary organizations, that's the very conduit that sucks you into paramilitarism. And so they were terribly circumspect. We never heard a bitter word. Mm. People came to our house because, as it happened, we knew who had assaulted my brother. And the police, because of the young man's association with the Orange Order through his father, the police told us they, that he was virtually untouchable, regrettably, at that time. He then subsequently went on to murder um, another man. Um, and if they had got him, you know, for my brother's um, attempted murder, maybe they mightn't have had they mightn't have been able to do what they subsequently did. But anyway, um, at that time, lots of people came to our door. They knew who had committed the offense, and they wanted, it was almost like they were looking for an imprimatur from my family to go do something bad to them, and my parents were adamant, no way, absolutely mm. not. They didn't want this visited in any other family. Also, um, we had grown up at the top of the Shankill. The Shankill Road is largely a loyalist stronghold, Protestant loyalist stronghold, and as then my parents planked us you know, at the t at the, in the middle of that, uh, that's where we lived at the top of the Shankill Road, and a place called the Woodvale Road, which is just an extension of the Shankill Road. And um, our next door neighbors were a, a lovely family whom we got to know well. They were Plymouth Brethren. My sister became, we, we, we were all very good friends, and my sister was bridesmaid to one of their daughters, but their son, joined the UVF. It's a Protestant loyalist paramilitary organization. He went out on a killing spree one night after a particularly egregious um, killing by um, the IRA. Every day, during those days, it was tit for tat. A Catholic died tonight, a Protestant died tomorrow night. A Catholic died tonight, tit for tat. So um, there had been an, a, a killing by the IRA of someone or other, uh, some, a Protestant person, I think actually a police officer. 
And in response to that, he went out on a killing spree and he killed four Catholics and, ironically, one Protestant. And the Protestant man whom he killed was walking down past the Catholic chapel. So they presumed that he was, they presumed that he was a Catholic, which he wasn't. My cousin had a little shop across the way and he went, uh, he heard the shooting, he saw the man fall, he, went, he recognized him, he knew him, he was a neighbor. Um, and he went across and he held him. And actually, he did something that afterwards, he didn't know whether he should have done or not. He said, in the Catholic tradition, when a person is dying, um, there is a tradition of saying the act of contrition, an act of sorrow for one's sins before meeting your maker. And if you're not able to say it yourself, someone very often will whisper it in your ear. And my cousin did that that day, but he always had a conscience about doing it for a Protestant man. He didn't know, and he never told the family that he had done it. So uh, three years ago, uh, this, this all happened the best part of 40 years ago now, and three years ago, I got a phone call from that man's daughter, who was then, I think, eight years old. And she had been approached by the historic inquiries team who are investigating cold cases. And they told her, they gave her the file, and, or she maybe have, had approached them, I'm not sure which, and she saw our names in the file as being, that I had mentioned her father because I've, I knew, I watched him going up and down the road. He always used to comment. Uh, he was a lovely person. He always used to comment. My mother was an inveterate knitter. And she would send the nine of us out in matching sweaters. <laughs> and we hated her. And matching socks and matching everything. And we just hated it. And this poor man who died, he used to often stop us on the road and compliment us and say what a wonderful mother we had. We actually were matricidal, we wanted to kill the woman. <laughs> and certainly stab her to death with knitting needles. And um, we just hated this parade of fair eyes sweaters. And I remembered him and at some stage I had mentioned him in a broadcast and there it was in the historical inquiries team. And I mentioned in that that my cousin had been with him when he died. So anyway, this now married woman with a grown up family came to see me. And she said that she knew nothing about her father's death because her mother very quickly slipped into dementia. And these are the, see, these are the untold stories. We all know about the deaths, but the, the damage that's done and the grief and the loss. And she told me about her anyway. And so her, her, nobody knew, nobody ever talked to her. They assumed that an eight-year-old kid that had all passed over her head and she, what would she know, what would she want to know? But now she did want to know. So I said to her, I'm going to tell you something that, that I probably shouldn't tell you, I'm going to tell you anyway. And I told her about what the act of contrition meant in Catholic theology or doctrine and that my cousin had done this and she sat and she wept oh. and she said it was the best gift she could have been given. And so, out of those small things, you understand the humanity that exists in the otherness of others whom you have been led to believe are beyond contempt because of their otherness. Now, this young man who lived next door to me, or a couple of doors from me, he ran in and out of our house. And by pure, and, and, here, and so he knew that we were Catholics, right? So, and he goes out one night and he kills four Catholics and a Protestant. When he made his confession statement, he was caught very quickly, and he made a confession statement in which he expressed tremendous sorrow for the killing of that poor Protestant man and absolutely no regret for killing the Catholics. Now, by again, pure accident, I was just a very junior barrister. And in those days, you were given a brief, literally, somebody would hand you, you know, a bunch of papers and say, go down into the cells. There's somebody up on a charge. And I went down into the cells, given this brief this morning, never even looked at the papers, went downstairs into the cell, and who was it? Only my neighbor. Well, I immediately had to resign from the case, of course. But um, as before I did that, I said to him, John, I've, I can't believe that you expressed no sorrow for the killing of Catholics. I said, sure, you know we're Catholics and we've lived next door to you for years. And he said, ah, but you're different. Mm. And I said, no, I don't think we're different. I don't think we're different. These people were all random. Ah, but I know you. And that always stuck with me. I know you. And we did not actually know each other. 
We lived cheek by jowl, we lived as neighbors, but we didn't live as good neighbors, and we did not live in community. We lived in communities, even though we lived on the same street, hermetically sealed, wrapped up in bubble wrap so that we couldn't actually get to know each other. And we felt, Martin and I, when I came into the presidency, that the most important thing that we could do was to unwrap that bubble wrap, to break those hermetic seals, to try and get people to know one another. We knew it was doable because we'd both grown up in Protestant areas and we'd loads of Protestant friends, and they became our resource because they were the people we went to when, when I was elected and we said, look, come to the, come to the house of the president and bring people with you who over their dead bodies would ever come to the House of the President of Ireland. And that was our target, to get to the hardest to reach people so that we could talk to them without wanting to convert them. Because as you know in Ireland, you know, particularly in Northern Ireland, we're always engaged somehow in a politics of conversion that involves trying to get the other part. We're only happy if the other person says, yeah, you're completely right. I give up all my previous views. We're always in evangelical mode. We only will accept the other when they become clones of us. And we knew that, the, I mean, that that's the zero sum game that had kept us perpetually in conflict. We were gonna have to get to a point of saying, you believe this, I believe that. Do you think we could work on a decent future together? You know, do you think we could actually find a common enough platform to work together, even allowing for difference? So that's what we decided to do, that we would bring people to our home and we'd sit and talk over tea and buns or whatever, and we'd talk about ch children and the future and what their plans were, and, and we would try and steer initially away from the hard stuff, because frankly, if you put the hard stuff on the table on day one, people just get up and walk away. We, haven't, we, didn't, have, we didn't have the kind of maturity and the language to deal with each other. All the language was always designed to force breakdown, you know? Mm. Um, and that's why our peace processes in the past had always faltered and failed, because we just tried to do too much without building, without building trust. Because the, 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 there's a great line in John Hewitt's poem, one of his poems, it says, we build to fill the centuries arrears and the biggest arrears were in mutual trust and distrust. So that's what we, we just started to build friendships and we brought them to our home. We never had a camera. We said to them, if you want to bring cameras and take pictures, that's fine, but we're not taking them for, the re for this reason, that we don't want you to think this is a photo opportunity. A lot of cynicism around politics, you know, and a lot, lot of cynicism around spin. And, and we said to them, you're not just going to come once. You know, we'll keep phoning you and tormenting you. You'll come back to us and that we were about the business of building friends. So ironically, it has resulted in, here we are, you know, 14 years in the presidency, and three years later, most of our friends are former paramilitaries. <laughs> yeah, so. do, and I mean, do you think, I mean, obviously the world now, the newspaper is full of renewed conflict. We're living through you know, violent times in the Middle East, in the Ukraine, and so on. The Irish, peace process is, it's, it's faltering, and we can go on to talk about that in its future, but it has, you know, been successful so far. And we're not in this situation we were in, in the early 70s. Do you, th what lessons do you think the Irish peace process has for other conflict zones in the world? Well, all conflicts are very, very different by their nature, and they have different histories. And people, as I know from our experience, we can look at the same kind of historic landscape and we can look through the same eyes, you know, and we see very different things. Mm. And I also know the extent to which, when we were discussing over the years, the situation in Northern Ireland with people who were pundits and so-called experts and people who were very interested, often we would come away saying they, they, they don't get it. They just don't get it. Because somehow you had to, you had to be embedded deeply in it to even begin to understand part of it. And so I, looking at the conflicts that we have, to, I, so I wouldn't say that the conflict in Ireland, in Northern Ireland and its resolution has a kind of, that we have actually got, we've, we, we've, you know, we've got an, an iPad, you know, press button, take this and you can take it to Iraq and everything will be fine mm -hmm. because you just hit this button and do what we did in Ireland. But I think there are human processes that are transferable 
And there are human lessons that are probably transferable. And one is, you always need people to keep focused on making peace because ultimately, many of these things, you take the, take the Palestinian Israeli crisis, which is an ongoing crisis. These people are neighbors, the Palestinians and the Israelis, like the Catholics and Protestants, like England and Ireland, we are neighbors. We're always gonna be neighbors. We're not going anywhere, they're not going anywhere. We kind of would wish over the years that they would all go away because that would make life difficult, so much easier. If all the people we disagreed with would just go somewhere else, and the only people who were left were us who all agreed with each other, not realizing, of course, in five minutes we'll all be falling out over something else. Um, so, but that, that landscape of perfection, you know, is actually a landscape of human imperfection. That's not the landscape that we are called to deal with. We have to deal with difference and diversity, and we have to make friends and partners of neighbors because there's a lot of things need doing in the world and they're a lot better done and eat more easily done if we do them together. There are so many obstacles, there are so many problems. If we constantly are wasting the resource of our energy and fighting over enmity and maintaining enmity, then we are wasting our lives and wasting this great human resource. I believe in good neighborliness. I think good neighborliness we all need it, you know, we're not islands, we need our neighbors, and it's better if we're good neighbors to each other. And that's the lesson from Northern Ireland, that it is possible, that's the big lesson, it is possible to bridge literally centuries of enmity and begin the process of making good neighbors of old enemies. I mean, we're not there yet, we're not completely there yet, but we are, we're, we're a heck of a lot further along than we were for most of my life. I, I'm just thinking, um, you know, the story you told about your parents and their example, don't retaliate, don't respond, mm -hmm. and how healthy that was, and how you can see how that would facilitate reconciliation. But I'm wondering, you know, sometimes the instinct to respond, the instinct to level, you know, the field, level the pitch, um, to react, because that's what a sort of a justice demands. And, I, and I, I'm coming around in also um, to ask you a question also about legacy issues in Northern Ireland, which still remain unsolved. The on the runs, the uh, people, you know, the people in the on the runs being paramilitaries who have committed a crime which has not been um, uh, fallen under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, not released. This is an ongoing issue. Uh, also, uh, um, 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 soldiers, for instance, who haven't been tried. And I'm wondering, obviously, some of the impulse there is to let things go, you know, to forget the past. Do you think, or, or let go the grievance, do you think that the price of peace is sometimes justice, is sometimes the call for justice? I think that the experience of Northern Ireland is that if you want to build peace, the first thing you're going to have to accept is the need for compromise. Mm. Because um, we've always worked out of a mindset which insists on, it's very much an imperial mindset, it's very much the mindset of all the centuries that have preceded us, that winner takes all. And that mindset has cost the world dearly. And for me, the, the, what happened in Northern Ireland was a realization that this was going to, always gonna be a zero sum game because if whoever won the 100% could never hold that 100% safely because the people who lost were waiting in the long grass, they were frustrated, they were angry, they were always going to find another day when they could have a go. So nobody benefits from that. So I, I'm a pragmatist. I've all, mm -hmm. I think the woman in me, the mother in me, the eldest of nine children in me, um, always would be the pragmatist. And I would ask myself, what could I give up here? What am I willing to surrender in order that we, cre we could create, my, my mantra has always been, 90% of something is a heck of a lot better than 100% of nothing. Mm. And if you grew up through a civil war, you lose your friends as we did through violence, and you watch the decimation of violence, violence is the 100% of nothing game. So there were things that we were willing to give up for the 90, to have 90% of something. Like for example, I'm a bog standard Irish nationalist. I believe in the value and the ambition of Irish unity. In fact, I'm absolutely convinced that until Ireland is fully reconciled politically and socially, that its truest, its truest nature, its truest potential will never ever reveal itself. So that's where I come from. <laughs> so
so, but I also know that is the worst nightmare of unionists. They are not persuaded yet that that is a reasonable ambition for anybody to have or a reasonable future for them. So the onus is on people like me to persuade them. And ironically, one of the way, now the, the IRA had always thought that you could bomb them into it um, and persuade them that way, which, you know, I'm not sure, you know, you just look around the world at people who tried to persuade, you know, persuade you to have a faith by virtue of telling you you must have it or else you'll be killed. Um, that doesn't strike me as particularly intelligent and it's, uh, you know, it's a terrible, it's a terrible assault on human dignity. So for me, ironically, the way of, the way I could see to best getting that future at some time, probably long after I'm dead, but hopefully, was to say, I'm prepared to surrender that. The Good Friday Agreement says that those of us who are Irish nationalists gave as a gift the belief that we were entitled to Irish unity because we'd always believed that English occupation was illegal and that Northern Ireland, you know, that, that, the, that, the, um, that the creation of the Northern Ireland state was wrong, blah, blah, blah. We, gave all, we, we said emphatically, accepting all of that and believing all of that, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a step back and say, that the constitutional position of Northern Ireland is as part of the United Kingdom. And we're going to agree to that, provided that that is the will of the people of Northern Ireland. And that if the people of Northern Ireland change their mind, and their minds will be tested periodically by way of referendum, and if they ever decide they want a united Ireland, both governments then, they conceded that they would, each government, the Irish government, the British government, that they would facilitate unity. So here you have, you know, you have the unionist position given that comfort that it's theirs. So that gives them everything to work for to persuade nationalists that Northern Ireland is going to be a place of parity of esteem where they will have full civic equality and a good life. On the other hand, you have Irish nationalists like me, Irish Republicans, given the opportunity to persuade by politics and by the force of argument that maybe there is something in being part of a bigger entity, but a bigger entity that is not in a war or a conflict with the next door neighbor Britain, but is a good neighbor to Britain. You know, despite all the ups and downs and all the mess of that relationship that we have now de decided, and it is a decision, it's a decision. We've made a decision that we're going to be good neighbors. We're going to work together. We are co-sponsors of the peace process. We are, if you like, co-stewards of it. And that has changed, I think, the whole dynamic. Um, so for me, you know, the, the, pr the pragmatist in me says that this is worth doing if in the doing of it, we enhance peace on the ground and that we're not, we're not suppressing or repressing any truths. Um, I think it is probably true that there were deals done and some people say they didn't know about the deal. Some people, look, I have difficulty with that because a lot of these deals were spoken about openly, written about openly, but I'm also prepared to accept that in order to be able to bring on board paramilitary organizations, people who inhabit dark spaces, that sometimes things have to be done in dark corridors to get them to persuade them out into the light. Mm. And I'm grateful that people were prepared politically to take really fairly significant risks because those risks were taken in order that my kids and grandkids could have, could walk the streets of Northern Ireland without fear and without, you know, with pride in their hearts and their place of birth. Yeah. Um, very, very interesting. And there's a huge amount more we could do to talk about the troubles, but I want to, um, shift the emphasis, if I can, a little bit. Um, I mean, one word that comes into my mind when you talk about getting to know someone, even ne necessarily getting to know your neighbour, mm -hmm. getting to know them without particularly, perhaps talking about the conflict, but getting to know around the conflict, the need for compromise. Uh, a word that's coming into my mind is the need for understanding, the idea of what understanding is, the idea of an opening of mind, of opening of heart. Um, and I'm using that to think about education and what education means in the conflict, and what education means more generally. We're having this conversation in a university. Um, you are somebody who, in your own life, I mentioned that you were the first in your family to go to university. Um, 
I note that even apart from formal education, you inform yourself about your, what, what you are doing, but you know, in terms of theory, we heard you on Sunday talking about theological issues. You're hugely informed, and by the sounds of it, always have been. Now, since you stepped down from presidency, you've been pursuing a doctorate. So you've got a personal interest in, in you know, you spend a long time, you, you spent, you're currently spending a lot of time in universities, whether it's the Gregorian University in Rome, and you've been to Boston. So I'm just wondering, I mean, there's a broad question here. There's the question of, Know, knowledge in its broad sense, of understanding in its broad sense, and there's also the institutional question about universities and about institutions of education and what they can offer society in terms of conflict resolution, in terms of personal development, in terms of expansiveness of heart and mind. What are your thoughts about that? What are your thoughts oh, about education? I think that education is probably one of the reasons why we have the peace process today and why we have this very sophisticated um, new architecture of peace wrapped up in the Good Friday Agreement and the St. Andrews Agreement. These are incredibly sophisticated treaties. And they had to be. They are robust, they are strong, they are intelligent, uh, they are scholarly. They have unbundled all the elements of, the, of past failures, all the elements of the, of the parties to the peace and they've tried to address them in an architecture that would hold, that would hold even if there was an atrocity, because up until then, the politics of the last atrocity always dictated breakdown instantly. So these, this structure had to be robust, and it has been tested many times through atrocities because we're still not away from the complete atrocity woods. Please God, we are away, further away than ever, but there's, there are still a small, there are small, groups with very, few, very little support who would try to break the, the intelligence of that structure. And they have, and every time it has been tested, every time it's been tested, the structure has proven to be incredibly robust because it is owned by the people. Now, where did education came in, come in? in educa education for me is the big, it's the big watershed between our generation and all the previous generations who had tried to resolve or reconcile their political differences. We were the first, Martin and I are the first generation to benefit from free second level education and free third level education. My parents left school at 14 and 15 years of age respectively because although they were both very bright and intelligent, there wasn't the prospect coming from poor homes, there wasn't a chance of getting an education, something they both missed desperately and felt a great lack of confidence in standing up in the world and having their say because they didn't have credentials. And so they impressed upon us the need for education and were so glad that we were a generation who were going to get these chances. So out of the universities, in Northern Ireland they came out a little bit earlier because we had free second level education at the end of the yeah. 1940s. It didn't happen in the Republic until the end of the 1960s. But you can see the phenomenal uplift because Ireland now has one of the most highly educated workforces in the world, bar none. And here is now what up until that we had, education was for the elite, for a small elite. Now you have this mass of brain power and ambition, yes, hungry and ambitious, and it's bringing its brain power, its collective brain power to bear on the problems of old. And so old epithets, old ways of telling history, for example, mm -hmm. will no longer do. Why? Because we have social scientists now and we have historians who interrogate these stories and either prove or disprove them. Take a very simple thing that proves at the end of the day not to be so simple. And that it's a story that everybody's involved in watching at the moment. And that is the commemorations of the 1418 war, the First World War. Growing up in Northern Ireland, the received wisdom was that the only people who fought in that 1418 war were Ulster Unionists who sacrificed everything for the liberation of Europe. That Irish Catholics, particularly those south of the border, that they had stayed out of it, that they didn't have the commitment to the small nations of Europe and that they were somewhat cowardly. That was more or less the received wisdom by the time I was growing up um, in the aftermath of the Second World War. How 
and of course, may I say on the other side of the equation, from an Irish nationalist point of view, that narrative was terribly helpful because we didn't have to deal with the fact that a quarter of a million people from the island of Ireland, most of them Irish nationalist Catholics, wore British uniform and fought in that war. Their narratives when they came back to an Ireland that had now up, had the rising, the Easter rising against the British, there was all that, that, that mess. And many of their memories of those who had served or those who had died, whether it was the Somme or Gallipoli or wherever, Messine, they memorably, as somebody described it to me, their memories were consigned to shoeboxes in the attic. And we then developed separate, largely separate narratives, not everybody. Thankfully, there were enough scholars to keep the threads of reality. But then when the educated generation came, they started to probe these narratives and suddenly they told the truth about them. And they told the truth at a very important time. We needed, we needed shared platforms or platforms of shared memory because we were such divided communities. You know, Irish, British, British, Irish, never the twain shall meet. And then suddenly we're able to say, well, the Irish fought in British uniform. Maybe you can carry a twin identity. Maybe it's possible to have elements of both in your DNA, your political DNA, your identity. Maybe it's possible for us to start telling this story in a different way so that loyalists, unionists, nationalists, republicans, all of whom had fathers, grandfathers, and granduncles who wore the British uniform, who fought at Messine, that they can stand together at Cenotaphs. It's interesting that for the first time ever, um, the Irish Prime Minister, the Taoiseach, was able to place a wreath at a cenotaph this year in memory of those who died in the Great War. Now that has been a journey, but it's been a journey of facts. It's been a journey of saying to people, hang on a minute, you got the story the wrong way up. We're putting the Lego bricks the right way up now, and when you look at them, you're going to be surprised at this story, because if you respect the people on your side who died, you're going to have to respect the other side as well because they fought together. And that has been a really very powerful drawer together of people. It was probably most visible when Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth came to Ireland on the first state visit by a British monarch in 100 years, or the first time they'd set foot in the Republic of Ireland in 100 years, back in 2011. One of the places she went to was Island Bridge, which is dedicated to those who died in the First World War, a, a be very beautiful memorial that had actually gone into quite, had become decrepit mm -hmm. over a period of time and then now was being, you know, was beautifully, beautifully reconstructed. And it was very interesting to Martin and I to see the people who gathered there. Loads of people who over their dead bodies a few years earlier would be in each other's company. But now they had something they could discuss that would not lead to breakdown because this was a common language. And so, and I went to Belgium in 1998, um, shortly after being here uh, in Australia on my very first ever state visit as a baby president, thanks to Dick O'Brien's coaching. Um, uh, during that time, Dick was the most extraordinary ambassador, uh, still is for Ireland, I have to say, in retirement. And I didn't, I didn't realize how lucky I was on my first date visit. You know, I think I made 40 speeches in about eight days. And if I did, it was under the tutelage of uh, this, this, the, the great master of uh, dipl diplomacy. Amazing. Uh, so I was very fortunate. But two months later, I went to Messine in Belgium with Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. And there we opened, for the first time ever, a joint memorial to the Irish who died in the First World War in British uniform. And um, that was a wonderful thing. Um, and that we have this peace park there and it's become a place of pilgrimage of people from all persuasions. And so it, what that proves to me is you can change the narrative, you can put the narrative the right way up. And, and that's also true incidentally of hard truths because sometimes you had to confront constituencies with hard truths. I mean, for me, one of the most important days in the peace process was when David Trimble said very, very important words that Northern Ireland had been a cold house for Catholics. Now, there was a lot of 
acknowledgement of hurt and pain and that, but it took a long time for that kind of accept acceptance and acknowledgement uh, to dawn, I think, on the unionist community. They did not see themselves as bigots. They did not see themselves as people who kept Catholics out of votes and jobs. They saw themselves in a self-righteous mode. So, um, and on the other hand, um, on the Republican side, they had to be confronted with the reality that said, if you kill a police officer, that's regarded as sectarian, you know, by the unionists. Mm. That's regarded as, but whereas their view would be, no, it's not sectarian, we're striking at the state. But sometimes you've got to stand in the shoes of the other to see things through the prism of his eye, to understand his anger, to understand why it is he constantly seems to do the very thing that upsets and annoys and angers you. And I think that that was, you know, all of those lessons we learned, uh, that we learned the hard way. Yeah. I mean, sometimes letting go of narratives, letting go of narratives which are very important can be painful as well as opening. Um, and I'm, I'm just, um, just coming to a final question, uh, which you've opened up for me very nicely by, the, by, the, by your remarks about the First World War uh, and about history. We, we here are doing a project uh, um, on, uh, as part of the Centre's work on uh, the Irish, uh, Irish-born Anzacs. And the same story really applies in Australia about the idea of the Irish, the Irish in Australia, uh, and the politics of sectarianism, which the Irish met, and the idea of the Irish as being disloyal and not properly, not, not, good, not good citizens of Australia. But of course, there were, that story and those myths were hugely confounded by the number of Irish people fighting uh, for, fought for the, uh, uh, the, Aust the Australian Imperial Forces. Um, and that's you know, something that we contribute, which, which leads me to my final question, which will make Richard O'Brien very happy, which I know will make you happy, and that is, the role of Irish studies, the role of Irish studies international, and role, I mean, we talk about education, you talk about the acquisition of knowledge, but Irish studies around the world, centres like this, um, what, um, what role do you think they have, or what contribution can we make to the welfare of the Irish nation and the Irish relations around the world and the cause of peace and reconciliation? I think scholarship is absolutely an essential tool in this world of ours. Scholarship that probes, that asks questions, that produces facts, that probes givens, that pushes envelopes, that makes us, that forces us out of our complacency, forces us out of the spaces that we have been driven into by the edited versions of life that we've been given. All around the world, the, where we're the, one of the most emigrating nations right around the world, um, and we have an extraordinary legacy of narrative that we need to know about, to, to mine. Mm. Um, one of the things, I'm just sitting here, I'm watching, I just spotted Thomas Kennelly in the, in the audience there, and one of my just great heroes. Mm. And I'm thinking of how important it is to acknowledge that wherever the Irish have been planted and how many generations they are, what they do there is part and parcel now of our heritage. Not everything that is Irish heritage happens or is initiated on the island of Ireland. There are rivers and torrents and waterfalls and subterranean streams flowing in other places and spaces, some of them flowing into each other, some of them that we have not yet accessed, some of them that we haven't joined up and that we really need to. That's where the world of scholarship is so mm. important and education. It's why I believe our generation was able to successfully do, initiate the peace process, because we were able to mine information from all around the world, and importantly, initiate uh, very powerful relationships with our Irish abroad. I look at the work of um, successive governments in the United States who helped the peace process. I look at the Irish writers who kept faith with Ireland, who kept interest bubbling, who gave us ideas and support and encouragement. Because what happened in the peace process did not just happen on the island of Ireland. It was very much a networked effort. I think of last night we had the event of the Australian Ireland Funds. Where would we be only for the work of those funds mm -hmm. in funding, even at the time, small community-based projects which help people who were living that close together but in ign ignorance of each other, suddenly they got a little bit of money that allowed them to work on common projects. Common projects led to friendships, led to understanding, led to a little patchwork quilt of 
good neighbourliness out of which we were able to stitch together the peace process. Seamus Heaney puts it brilliantly in what, for me, the, the, one of the greatest poems that he ever wrote was from the Canton of Expectation. And it's about what happened when education really took off in Ireland. And he describes those who came out of the universities, the first generation like myself and Martin. He describes us as having intelligence as brightened and unmannerly as crowbars. And it's a brilliant expression because you have to, instead of really what he, and, and we also know that wonderful expression of his from the poem Digging, where he makes, his father is digging the potatoes with the spade and he has the pen and he's going to dig with this. And so we have, we who are educated, we who have access to brilliant scholarship, not the scholarship that is designed to, you know, the, like, the, like the Islamic State scholarship, you will believe this or else, mm. but scholarship that is open, that is curious, that is courageous. Scholarship that challenges us. That's what an educated mind responds to. That's what universities introduce us to. Possibilities, potential. And I think that's one of the great gifts that we were given to be part of that generation that had the intelligence brightened and unmannerly as crowbars. What were the crowbars needed for? To remove the obstacles. And there are always obstacles in the way of human development. But instead of going from you know, what we had done in previous years, you know, in previous generations, go from naught to punch you in the face in two seconds, because yeah. you disagree with me, to develop a much more sophisticated range of responses. Um, it summarized for me, um, I'll try and avoid using crude language in this, but I don't know if any of you know the story of uh, um, Mrs. Brown's Boys. Anybody here watch Mrs. Brown's Boys? My mother says she doesn't watch it. I know she watches it. I know she watches it. So there's a lot of very crude language in it. But a friend of ours who is a priest um, was put into a parish that he wasn't terribly happy in. He had a pastoral council that was very bullshy and constantly, you know, were telling him, you know, what he could do, should do, and must be doing. And they had him driven astray in the head. But he said, I asked him, how are you coping with it one day? And he said, I got the answer. And I got it from Mrs. Brown's voice, which seemed rather unlikely to me. But here's how the story went. In this particular episode of Mrs. Brown's Boys, Agnes Brown, who's your Dublin mammy, and a bit hard on the old bad language, well, no, a bit, bit in the sense of using it regularly as punctuation. Um, she's talking to her son-in-law, her son's mother-in-law, Hilary, who's very snooty. And Hilary is saying to Agnes, when my first child was born, my husband bought me a mink coat. And Agnes says, that's nice. And then Hilary says, well, when my, when my second daughter was born, my husband bought me a diamond ring. And again, Agnes said, that's nice. And um, so then Hilary says to Agnes, and what did your husband buy you when your children were born? And Agnes said, he bought me a set of elocution lessons so that I could say that's nice when I really feel like saying F off. <laughs> and, um, so, um, so that's where we have to get to, that that's nice. You know, when we're provoked, instead of reacting with the age-old age way of thump, push, reach for the gun, reach for the bullet, reach for the angry scenario, hang on to the that's nice. Mm. And because the conversation <laughs> then continues, and maybe in the continuation of the, con of the conversation, you begin with a more sophisticated range of responses to get a more sophisticated range of problem-solving answers. And I'd like to think that our generation in Ireland are proving that point. Not perfect, needs to be worked at, needs to keep the, we need to keep our foot on the accelerator, but, um, but still a lot better than anything any previous generation has achieved, in my view. Well, Mary, I'm, I would love to go on. I've monopolized you much too much. I think it's um, quite appropriate that we had uh, Heaney and Mrs. Brown's boys, which are, yes. as we all know, <laughs> The, Sorry, Thomas. The high, point, the high point of northern and southern culture, alternately. <laughs> so we will, um, we, will, we will finish there. But there are, if I have time, just to um, thank you very much. OK. Well, these are good questions. They're quite short. Well, the first oh, one good. is, um, what is your favorite piece of Irish literature? Oh, mm. 
I, frankly, that is just the most difficult thing to ask. Um, Heaney is my absolute favorite poet, uh, mainly on account of he writes out of where I'm from. And so with every line, he's revealing to me things about my life, my place, my people, that my brain hadn't engaged with. And he's revealing me to me. Mm. And he's revealing my place to me. So without a shadow of a doubt, he is, he is my great hero. Lovely, and he's, and he's been famed this evening, yeah. so that's great. And after that, Flan O'Brien. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> without a shadow of a doubt, Flan O'Brien. Perfect. Um, if you could be president again for one more day, what mm -hmm. would you do? Oh, Lord. <laughs> well, I probably, you know, what I, what I would do um, is probably a very simple thing. Um, I probably, where we're at right now um, with the peace process in Northern Ireland, um, I would gather up all the people who are key influencers and key leaders and I'd bring them to the Arras and I'd have a Kayleigh Moore and I'd make <laughs> them get up and dance a set um, and I'd make, them, I'd make them feel ridiculous um, and we would do it with uh, loyalist music um, in their jig time and in our real time. And um, I'd, I think I would work on, the, I'd spend another day working on the friendships because I'm not sure um, that north of the border we are working enough still on the friendships. I think that we have possibly just, you know, we, there's, a de there's always the gravitational pull of sides and it's important that we constantly break out of that to think of ourselves as partners. Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd like to push the partnership to forcing them into dance, uh, dance an eight-hand reel or a set together. Like, yeah. Sounds like a fantastic idea. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is sort of a cheap question because you've already answered it a little bit, but uh, there's a second part to it. What, where do you see Irish studies in your global vision of the Irish family? Hmm. I think that they are an underpinning of the Irish family, a very important underpinning. It's been a great joy to me, I have to say, to see over the past number of years the extent to which the idea of Irish studies has started to grow. And the fact that it has grown and grown exponentially, it grew in Britain, it grew, it's grown in Canada, it's grown in America, it's mm. growing here, that vindicates to me its essence. It vindicates its importance and the fact that we need it. We are a massive constituency. We're a massive constituency worldwide doing extraordinary things, doing amazing things. And we're also historically a massive constituency. And I think somehow by virtue of always being, if you like, the oppressed, being the, being, you know, the us against empire in a sense, um, we evolved um, a way of thinking about ourselves that always put, we always put ourselves into shadows. Mm. And we didn't always tell our narrative and we didn't always tell it well. And sometimes we let other people tell our narrative and tell it incorrectly um, or grow um, stereotypes. And I think it's, this is why scholarship at the heart of the Irish narrative and at the heart of the Irish family is so important. Well, look, um, what an, uh, you know, it's been extraordinary having you here. Thank you so much for all those answers. Thank you so much for being so engaged. I could go on, but we have to, I think, draw a line under the proceedings. So can you, uh, before Ian's going to come up again uh, and, and uh, uh, make a presentation, but before then, maybe we could thank Professor McAleese for, for coming this evening.